Our Bible study this morning is based on the, actually the Old Testament lesson for last week from the book of Proverbs, but we're just going to look specifically at the whole idea of wisdom and Proverbs as we're about to begin a new academic year at Iowa State. And we begin with a prayer of wisdom based on one of the oanaphons that we do before the Advent services. It's the basis for the hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O wisdom, proceeding from the mouth of the Most High, pervading and permeating all creation, mightily ordering all things, come and teach us the way of prudence. Amen. Well, what is wisdom? Well, where we find wisdom in the Bible is we find it in some areas of the Old Testament, like some of the Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. It's also found in the Apocrypha, those, those books that were written between the Old and New Testament, which are not part of our regular scriptures, but they're useful books. And two of them, the book called Sirach and the Wisdom of Solomon, are both considered wisdom. When we talk about wisdom, we need to think of it first objectively as the natural law, the, the way things are, just the way things are set up. The wisdom is knowing that and being in sync with that. But subjectively, it's what we do with our lives, that we order our lives to that, that we're able to cope, that you have know-how. And God then is seen as the greatest wisdom because God can cope with being God. He can handle being God, being in charge, running everything. We see three levels of wisdom. Personal wisdom, one-on-one, -on -one, and with yourself, but then also in relationships with other people, and then in terms of your balance with the entire nature and the whole world. It involves not only ethical things, but physical things. Luther said that God wove the Ten Commandments in the fabric of creation. So wisdom isn't just knowing what to do in terms of ethics, what's right and wrong. It's also tied in to the world itself, the natural laws, the way things are. You don't step off a cliff and expect that just because you want to, you won't fall. No, the, the laws of gravity are against you. So to be wise is to know the way things are both physically and to deal with that, but also to see how that relates to what is right and wrong in this world. We see this expressed in Romans 2, where St. Paul said, when the Gentiles, that's the non-Jews, not people of the Old Testament, who do not have the law, they don't have the Old Testament, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, where their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts excuse, accuse, or even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So this is saying that this wisdom is part of all the world. It's not just people who are in the Bible. It is part of what all people around the world have. Paul is talking about how God has not only created the world and through creation made himself known to the world, but there's a sense of ethical right and wrong, which fits in with the physical right and wrong of this universe. And that determines what is right and wrong. You can go throughout the world and you have a same sense, a similar sense of what is right and wrong. And this is involved with three situations for wisdom. What's involved in the family or clan, what's involved in the court and the political, and what's involved in the scribes, in the writings. You know, family or clan, that even where it's not written down, you have a sense of right and wrong within the family and within the larger family as a clan. And you have it then get to a larger level when you have nations that have courts and politics and you have a sense of what is right and wrong there. And then you have the scribal, the stuff that's written down for generations later on. And we see this in how the wisdom literature of the Old Testament, like the Proverbs, is parallel to some of the wisdom you see among the pag pagans. If you look at Proverbs 22, 7, verses 23, 1, and we can compare this to the teachings of Amenemope, which is, here's an example of it. This is from the Egyptians. It's a scroll that's written down, and 
if you look at it, it's very, very similar to what you find in Proverbs. Why? Because this understanding of wisdom, like Paul says, is found among all peoples. There's a very similar sense of what is right and wrong. You can do another comparison if you look at Psalm 104 and the pagan hymn of the sun or the song of the harper or the dialogue of a man with his soul, the Babylonian theodicy, theodicy. Now, theodicy is a defense of God. You know, people deal with the questions of, is there a God? How can there be a God and have evil and disorder in this world? This deals with that. And you have the wisdom of this man, Ahikar. Let me give you an example of that wisdom from Ahikar. Oh, my son, be like a fruitful tree on a roadside whose fruit is eaten by all who pass by and the beasts of the desert rest under its shade and eat of its leaves. Oh, my son, every sheep that wanders from its path and its canyon becomes food for the wolf. And these are very similar to what you see in Proverbs, the idea of using wisely what you have and not being foolish and being selfish. In first King, in Second Kings chapter four, we read about Solomon, his wisdom, so that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the east, east, and the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all other men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, Hermon, Calcol, Dardan, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. There's this sense of wisdom, the sense of what God gives to all people in creation helping give a sense of orderliness and goodness in the world. This is uh, seen uh, not only by Christians, but people like this, Thomas Jefferson, who wasn't a Christian, he was what they called a deist. Many of the fathers of this country were deists. They believed in a God, but not necessarily a Christian God, but they believed that God had a sense of right and wrong and orderliness. And this was part of what they saw in their makeup of the government. When Jefferson said that we've been endowed by our creator with certain unable rights, among these being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, notice, by our creator, this understanding of a God who gives wisdom to all. But there is a special wisdom in the Bible. When we understand this principle of the unity of Scripture and Scripture interprets Scripture, so what this says is as we look at the wisdom in the Bible, we always have to look at it in light with the whole scripture and where scripture talks about not just wisdom in general, but the very specific wisdom that God gives to us. And so for the Old Testament, wisdom can never be really truly to those outside the covenant, outside the relationship with God, because outside of God's claim to people, it's only the law in its second use, which condemns. What wisdom does implicitly is stated explicitly elsewhere. Let me go over that again. Well, if you don't have a relationship with God and you look real carefully at wisdom literature, the way things are supposed to be, we see that they aren't. They see that we go against that, that we sin. That's the second use of the law, the second use that shows as a mirror our sin and condemns us. And if we look at wisdom honestly, apart from our relationship with God, that's what we end up with. And when it says wisdom does implicitly what is stated explicitly elsewhere, it's saying that wisdom in the Bible is something that says even more clearly what we know from nature in terms of how we don't follow God's law, which leads to an understanding of the two ways we know about wisdom, through what we call general versus specific revelation. General is what all people know through nature, through the created world, but specific is only found through God's word. This is expressed beautifully in Psalm 19, where it starts with general revelation. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. You go out and you look at the stars at night. 
my son has a, a wonderful binoculars and the other night took us out in the park and we could see two of the moons of Jupiter and the rings around Saturn. Just amazing when you think of all that there is in this world. Let's us know that there's a God who exists. But the psalm goes on and says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Now he's not talking about general revelation. He's talking about specific, what we get through the word of God. When it talks about the law of the Lord in the Old Testament, it means the teaching of the Lord, God's word. And what that word does is make more than just simply let us know that God exists. It says it revives our soul. It gives life. It makes the simple wise. It imparts to us a relationship with God. Now, the general can be found in the specific, but the specific can only be found in the specific. In other words, we can look in God's word and see plenty of testimony to the fact that God exists and that there's a moral world in us. But in terms of gaining a relationship with God, in terms of really loving God and trusting God, that can only be found through God's word. So what we see is in wisdom, we see this general knowledge given in wisdom liturgy in terms of the specific revelation of the wisdom literature itself from God's word. But in the context of the covenant, the context of this relationship with God, which you gain through God's word, now this general revelation about way you should do things, living according to the way things are in the world, becomes now what's third use of the law. For those apart from relationship with God, we can't do that. Our sin is in us, and all wisdom does is show us all the more that sin. But in a relationship with God, then instead, it now shows us how we, in a relationship with God, can joyfully live according to that. And so what the Old Testament does to emphasize that is it personifies wisdom. It identifies wisdom. We'll see it with the second person, the Trinity, the Son of God. And it's linked to God's word. We see this wonderfully in John's gospel when he said the word, which is the principle, you know, the idea of God and the son of God became flesh and dwelt among us in Christ Jesus. Wisdom becomes a person. Now, that's why the first of the O antiphons, which is used on December 17th, the seven antiphons leading up to Christmas, is about wisdom. And it's talking wisdom as Jesus. Jesus, who came from the mouth of the Most High, reaching from end to end and ordering all things mightily. He's God Almighty. Now what's he telling him to do? To come and teach us the way of prudence. This is uh, the most magnificent church in the Eastern Christian, the Greek Christian population. This is the Hagia Sophia, which means holy wisdom. It's found now in Istanbul. Unfortunately, it's now seen as a museum or a mosque rather than a church, but it still was built to this understanding of Jesus as the wisdom of God. Now, when we look at that wisdom, though, we have to be careful about certain things. First of all, we don't want to disregard wisdom and separate from the gospel. There's a sense of saying, now that we're free in the gospel and forgiven, we can do anything we want. You know, we still need the wisdom to guide us. Again, that third use of the law. And we can't connect it to toleration. Just believe law, anything as long as you're good. That's not wisdom. Wisdom is not toleration. To, uh, wisdom is saying when something's wrong, it's wrong. And it's foolish to go that way. And finally, we can't misplace it for the gospel. Replacing the gospel with the righteous man. The idea that if I do all these good things, I'm right with God. No, because all these things have to be seen within the covenant, this relationship with we, God, which we have, not by being good, but simply totally out of God's grace, the gospel, the people of Israel chosen, not because they're good, but because God loves them. Pure grace. Now, within that grace now, you can then live according to that wisdom. Not to gain a relationship with God, but because you have one. This is expressed beautifully in one of the best summaries of wisdom in the Old Testament, Psalm 1. 
Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law, or we can think of it as the word, the teaching of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit and seeds, and its leaf does not wither. In all he does, he prospers. Therefore, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Now, you have to understand all this when he talks about the righteous and the wicked. It's not talking about what we do. It's what we are through a relationship with God. And he compares it wonderfully to trees, which really makes sense in the land of Palestine because Palestine's a lot like Western Iowa was when the pioneers first came here. The only place they noticed trees was along the rivers. And if a tree was rooted near a river, it had a constant source of water, it would prosper. Otherwise, it wouldn't make it. And he also talks about the wicked being like the chaff that the wind blows away. I had a chance to see this lived out very real well when I was in Ethiopia. And here you see the Ethiopians doing the traditional way of harvesting the wheat, the grain, that you take the cattle and you see you lead them over the grain and they smash it up. And then on a windy day, you take a pitchfork and you toss it in the air on a pavement. And the wind will blow away the chaff, the junk, the stuff that's only going to be used to be burned for garbage. And the seed that you're going to make the flower off falls out. And that's an illustration used throughout the Bible to describe God separating those who are wicked from those who are righteous. And understand this wickedness and the righteousness is not based on how good or bad they are. It's based on relationship with God. It's based on being a tree planted by the river. What makes the tree prosper is not that it's good, but it's that it's near the stream that provides for it. What makes us good and righteous is not what we do, but the fact that we're rooted in God. And that leads us to living the way of God. Going back here. Blessed is the man who walks. Now notice the progression. First you walk, then you stand, and then you sit. You know how we can get sucked into sin and evil. But it's saying, blessed by God's grace. We don't have to be that. Instead, our delight is in God. That's the basis of our relationships. Now, the wisdom is especially then seen with that basic summary of wisdom and seen in the book of Proverbs. And Proverbs tells us right off what wisdom is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You see, wisdom involves how I live. It's not knowledge. And knowledge involves thinking and processing. Wisdom's more than that. It's not just what we think. It's what we do. It's how we live. So can a person without much knowledge be wise? Yes, very much so. And can it can be a vice versa? Yes, There are people that have Nobel laureates and great prizes and still they can't have a good relationship with another human being. And there are people who very much never had a college education. You think of maybe grandmothers and great aunts and great uncles you had who were really wise people without a lot of great knowledge and education because they knew how to cope. They knew how to live within their world. And we see this understanding of wisdom versus knowledge expressed beautifully in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where St. Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think 
of what you were when many of you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many are influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, it is as written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. From a human standpoint, a lot of God's wisdom looks as foolishness. But that's because God chooses to do things off in a way that don't seem to make sense to us. To show that it's by his grace. He does things out of nothing. He does the impossible. To show that it doesn't depend on our wisdom, our abilities, our righteousness but totally on his love and grace. And that's the understanding of wisdom we have as we look at it in Proverbs. Proverbs taking this general revelation, similar to what you saw in neighboring nations, but applying it within the context of a living relationship with God. Here we look at briefly at the organization of the book. It first has a discourse on wisdom, and then what we normally think of as the Proverbs, Solomon's Proverbs, these sentence phrases that are still very wise. And then he talks about wise people. And then you have the, the court wisdom of Hezekiah, the wisdom of Augur, the wisdom of Lemuel, and finally this acrostic at the end of the book on the good woman. Acrostic is a poem where every verse begins with a succeeding letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So if you did it in English, the first letter of the first phrase would be with an A, and the second sentence would begin with a B, etc. Now, some of the themes that you see in Proverbs is an emphasis on youth being led by elders. It is better to have a father chastise you than an executioner punish you. FBI studies show this is true on criminals. They needed to let their hand on the cookie jar rather than capital punishment. What they're saying is this, by this is they found by talking to hardened criminals who committed murder, murder that even the fear of capital punishment was not enough to keep them from committing murder. They needed when they were young to be disciplined. They were needed when they were young to get slapped when they tried to put their hand in the cookie jar. So this idea of you need to learn wisdom from the elders very much centered in Proverbs and something that we forget all too much in our life today. And we see also how evil is equated with foolishness. If you watch these real crime shows, you so, see there's so much different than the television one. And the television ones, the criminals are always brilliant people. But we see that the average criminal, the criminals that you usually see in the cop shows, are really foolish, foolish we also see there's a whole list of different kinds of Proverbs. A typical one is the complete sentence, like 1128. Those who trust their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. And again, this comparison to being rooted in God, you're like a green leaf. But those who trust in something else, like riches, they're going to die. Or juxtaposition, like 1122. Like a gold ring in the pig's snout, it's a beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Now in Hebrew, a gold rune and a pig's snout, a be beautiful woman who shows no discretion. Okay? So the idea is you might have this beautiful ring, you see the wisdom of it, but what's it attached to? Just like a beautiful woman who might outwardly look good, but what you're really left with. Now you don't need the specific revelation of God to understand this. This is part of wisdom we see throughout the world. But what Proverbs is doing is putting it in the context of a living relationship with God. Because within that relationship, it not only is wisdom that we know in our minds, but it's what we can live. Because it's based on a relationship with Him, the God who forgives us and empowers us through the Holy Spirit to live that way. Another would be a better, worse proverb, like 16 eight. Better a little with the righteous than much gain with injustice. 
or numerical sayings. You have a lot of those. Four things on earth are small, yet extremely wise. Ants are creatures of little strength, yet they store up their food in the summer. Hyrax is a creature of little power that they make their home in the crags. Locusts have no sting. So you have a whole series of things. You would see this. Um, yet they advance in ranks. The lizard can be caught in the hand, yet it's found in king's palaces. In chapters 25 through 28, we have this wisdom of Hezekiah, which now takes the what we call street level wisdom, the wisdom among people, and puts it within the court, within the politics of things that you need to do. And there's also later discourse on wisdom. Wisdom in Hebrew is chacham, which is a feminine. Just like the Greek translation, Sophia is also effeminate. Now, Hebrew, this is the case because Hebrew is one of those languages oh, like Spanish. You don't have a neuter. Everything has to be a he or she. she. So characteristics in people, things like faith, love, hope, wisdom, they're all in the feminine. That's why uh, the words that are used to describe wisdom both in Hebrew and in Greek are feminine. Even though the wisdom of God is seen most fully in Jesus, who is a man. Now we see the purpose in the beginning of Proverbs of wisdom. Not just its definition, but its purpose. Because wisdom is not just what I think like a knowledge, it's how I live. And we find that so true in life. That knowing the right thing is only half the game. It's also a matter of of doing it. And that's why the whole importance of the elders to the youngers, because the elders don't just simply say things, impart the information. They are an example. You imitate them and you live that way. I mean, we all learn that ourselves, that we do what our parents do. There are things that maybe we didn't like about our parents and we find ourselves doing that, copying their same mannerisms or, or habits. And parents know very well the children don't do what you tell them to do. They do what you do. Well, the understanding in Hebrews is this is for people brought up within the covenant relationship. People bought in Proverbs, people who are in a relationship with God. And so these people who live that life are the example to the young ones of how to do that. In 120, wisdom is seen as a woman. Out in the open, wisdom... Wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. Uh, real important principle that wisdom, like a woman, is out there. Nothing hidden. When evil or foolishness is represented, it's also represented as a woman. It's a widow woman that was in hiding, one who has got to hide things because they know they're evil. But wisdom doesn't have anything to hide. It's out in the open because it's true. It's not deceitful. And we see wisdom seeing in God, the Trinity. By wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundation. By understanding he set the heavens in place. Now you say by wisdom. Well, when we understand Jesus as the wisdom of God, we're seeing how God, Yahweh, the Lord, and Christ Jesus, I mean, he is Lord too, but you see the Father and the Son working together in creating the world. And at 6, 1 through 19, we hear this, words from Proverbs, My son, if you put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands in a pledge for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said and stared by the words of your mouth. So do this, my son, to free yourself. Since you've fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a zell from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. A troublemaker and a villain who goes about with a corrupt mouth, who winks maliciously with his eyes, signals with his feet, and motions with his fingers, who plots evil with deceit in his heart. He always stirs up conflict. Therefore, disaster will overtake him in an instant. He will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. 
There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Now here you see something that's used throughout the Bible, this understanding of you say something then you add more to it. You have six things and seven that are tempestable. That is a typical Hebrew thing in Hebrew poetry to emphasize things. And you see the, the seven things that are listed. Things that are deceitful. Things that are not out in the open. Those that cause problems in this world. And again, these are all things that you can see that are evil, even without a knowledge of the Bible. But this is still done within the context of the people of faith. And you see this strong encouragement to work. That's part of the whole idea of wisdom, that you cope. And people who didn't work in the world at that time didn't have their food. They didn't have things stored up. They weren't going to survive. Okay? And he's also talking here about not getting yourself trapped into things that w beyond what you can do. And what you want to do is free yourself from that. It reminds us of the words of Jesus when he says, if you have something against someone else before you bring your gift to the altar first, make peace with him. So wisdom, but seen within the context of relationship with God. Then we have 8, 22, 31, which is a praise to wisdom, but this is something that had implications in the early Christian church. In this passage, it says, The Lord brought me forth from the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was formed long ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. This is talking about wisdom. Wisdom's talking. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the world or any fields or any of the dust of the earth, I was there when he set the heavens, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when he gave the sea its boundaries so the waters could not overstep his command, and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then it was constellated aside. It was filled with the light day after day, rejoicing in his presence, rejoicing in his whole world and delighting in mankind. So this seems to talk about wisdom as being something that God set up before he did any of the creation. And it's certainly true that we see God doing things according to wisdom, according to an order. Going back to what Luther said, when you go against the Ten Commandments, you're going not only against the moral, but the physical way that God created the world. God, as the one who created the world, ought to best know how we live in it. It's like the owner's manual. And so just as we know things about nature that you don't, uh, jump over a cliff, you don't drive into a flood. In the same way, you don't do things against the Ten Commandments. But there were some who took this understanding with the understanding of Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, as wisdom to mean that Jesus, the Son of God, was not on the same level as God. And this became big in the early Christian church and a controversy among these two people, Athanasius and Arius. Arius was convinced from this passage in Proverbs that the second person of the Trinity, the Word of God, who became Jesus when he was incarnate in Mary by the Holy Spirit, was a step down from God the Father. Whereas Athanasius was the one who emphasized, no, the Father and the Son are totally equal because for Athanasius, if that wasn't the case, then Jesus isn't God as he claimed to be and that nullifies all the Christian church. Plus, for Athanasius, instead of just looking at that passage in Proverbs, he had to look at the whole of Scripture where it's very much emphasis that Jesus is totally God. And there was this controversy was so finally settled by the Nicene Creed, the Nicene Council, where you had this long phrase in there to really emphasize that Jesus is fully God. You know, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being a one substance with the Father by whom all are made. So that's the Christian faith, that's the Orthodox Christian faith that we still hold today, which was so emphasized by Athanasius. Then in our lesson recently, we have this understanding of wisdom as a house. 
Wisdom is a woman building a house. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She's prepared her meat and mixed her wine. She set up her table. Now the seven pillars, seven the number for God. So this is something from God. She sent out her servants. She calls from the highest point of the city. Let all are simple. Come to my house to those who have no sense. She says, come, eat my food and drink the wine I've mixed. Leave your simple ways and you will live. Walk in the way of insight. The call to follow God. We see this also expressed in the New Testament because the New Testament makes use of wisdom and Proverbs. Luke 14 is the story of Jesus and what happens is he's at this banquet and he notices that the people really were trying to vie for the top are taking the most honored seat. And he quotes from the passage in Hebrews where it says, if so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you're invited, take the lowest place. So when your host comes, he will say to your friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all the other guests. And that goes from where it talks about in Proverbs, from Proverbs 25, remove wicked officials from the king's presence and his throne will be established through righteousness. Do not exalt yourself in the king's presence. Do not claim a place among the great, great. It's better for him to say to you, come up here than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. Now, this is seen as part of the court wisdom in Proverbs, but Jesus takes this now a step further where it's seen not just how you live within the court, but our whole attitude with God. Because if we try to buy for the high seat, we're trying to earn our relationship with God. But instead, if we come to God in a humble attitude, then God gives us the place of honor, not because we deserve it, not because we've worked for it, but through his love and grace. And you see that in the ministry of Jesus, that those who tried to vie with Jesus, tried to prove themselves to Jesus, he just knocked down to size. But those who came to him and said, have mercy on me, in humbleness, he welcomed him with open arms. We also look at Romans 12, 20 and compare it with Proverbs 25 again. Paul says, on the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. This goes back to Proverbs. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing so, you will heap burning coals on the head, and the Lord will reward you. Now, what is this burning coals on his head? Well, the idea is you're going to surprise them. They're expecting to hate you because they're enemies. But when you do this instead, you, sh you surprise them. You shock them. And what can happen is you can lead them to wonder about your God, this God who makes you that way. And Romans 2 compares with Proverbs 24. God will repay each person according to what they've done, St. Paul says. And in Proverbs said, if you say, but we knew that nothing about this. Does not God who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he guards your life with it? Will he not repay everyone according to what he has done? So the idea is you can't make an excuse and say, oh, I didn't know any better. God will judge us according to what we've done. And John 6, and this speaks us very recently because last Sunday's gospel was the story at the end of Jesus' great discourse on him being read of life, and it's compared then with what we just read from Proverbs 9, 6. Jesus said, This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of the things he's given me, but raise him up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. At this, the Jews there began to grumble about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They said, it's not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know. How can he now say I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourself, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them, and I'll raise them up on the last day. It is written, the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone has learned the father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. Verily, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, yet they died. But here's the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that come down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. 
Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves and said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, what you see here is the comparison between this, Jesus calling himself the bread of life, and what we read in Proverbs 9, this banquet set before and saying, come partake of this. This is the food. You eat this and you will live forever. And the wise thing is to see that the wise thing is to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the power of God's word, and take Jesus and put our trust in him. But the foolish ones are those who reject that. In Jesus' case, they reject it because they're looking to what they can figure out. How can this carpenter's son be this? And that can be the danger that we face to try to put trust in what we see in the prevailing wisdom of this world, which doesn't always coincide with God. But real wisdom is not about knowing all the facts. It's about the fear of the Lord. It's about living a life that can cope with the God who gives us everything. We continue then with prayer from the hymn, O Come, O Come, O Manuel. O come, thou wisdom from on high, who ordest all things mightily. To us the path of knowledge show, and teach us in her ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen. <laughs> 